Thank you. And I want to make sure to point out that James bought a really expensive suit just for this occasion. <laughs> I've never seen him dressed like this before. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. So, uh, Me neither, not even at work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't seen him dressed like that at his office. Uh, but thanks once again. Uh, I'm with the code team, which is a group of developers who work on community open source projects like Apache Mesos, uh, sponsored by Dell Technologies. And I guess you can go ahead and embellish that great introduction if, you, if you've got more to add. Uh, that was great, Alex. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I've been with Mesosphere a couple of years, and like Alex said, I uh, spent some time working on the Kubernetes Mesos framework and Marathon, uh, some other uh, Mesos related projects. So. Um, so I'm G, so if you're not in the previous talk, so uh, I, I'm a Mesos committer and PNC member since 2013 and working on containerization, networking, and storage. And I want to make, I want to point out a person who's missing in action here. We gave this talk at Mesosphere North America about a month ago, and at that time there was a fourth presenter, uh, Chakri, uh, who works for Diamante, and we had a represent, we basically wanted to represent a couple of storage providers because a key message here isn't that is that this is industry wide this effort to standardize on a container storage interface isn't just one vendor or a couple vendors and in LA we we had a couple representatives but he couldn't he couldn't make it here for this event but his slides are still here and I'm going to deliver his slides but I want to make sure that everyone's aware that he was a contributor to this deck. So here's an overview of the agenda. We're going to uh, cover the state of storage in container orchestrators today, uh, then move on to the benefits of standardization. And there's a couple. There's benefits from a user perspective. Uh, how many users of Mesos or DCOS do we have out there today? Could show of hands? Quite so. Most of the audience falls into that category. Uh, but from the uh, authors of container orchestrators, not just Mesos, but DCOS, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, Docker Swarm, there are benefits to this. Then finally, from the storage provider's perspective, there are benefits from standardization. We're going to give a quick overview of CSI, uh, moving on to Mesos integration with CSI. Um, We've got plans for releasing this late this year, but there's a roadmap that goes on with further enhancements beyond that. We're making an effort to get this out quickly uh, rather than you know, take a lot of time to do the full featured version day one. Uh, finally, we're going to close with uh, a message as to how you can get involved and maybe help contribute to the decisions on what features we might want to add to that roadmap and maybe even help out building the things over the next year. So the background from the uh, uh, user perspective is that uh, users need or want support for persistent storage uh, for, to run stateful apps under container orchestrators. Uh, they want this abstraction because it allows portability potentially across container orchestrators, across the boundary between public clouds. You know, they want, you want portability from the Amazon cloud to the Google cloud, and then even onto an on-prem cloud. You'd also like to have something that would enable portability across storage providers so that you could write and implement applications that aren't even aware of what the underlying storage provider is, uh, and then change that over time, uh, migrate your app from an on-prem cloud to a public cloud and not have to change it. Uh, some of these stateful apps that could benefit from this are shown here by logo, SQL databases, NoSQL databases, uh, a whole category of things that uh, need to retain state somewhere that don't have Alzheimer's when you shut down the container that holds them. Uh, so the, the background from the perspective of uh, 
of container orchestrators is that we have a number of container orchestrators shown by the logos here. DCOS, Kubernetes, Swarm, Cloud Foundry, Apache, Mesos, that have evolved independently with their own independent implementation of a storage interface. Now, in reality, of course, uh, Apache, Mesos, and DCOS, maybe those two do have a common storage interface, but the rest, all in their first generation, came up with their own implementation. And uh, when, when they've implemented this, they've typically even integrated in their own versions of storage plugins that live in the source tree of that container orchestrator. So that is kind of bad, too, because with many of these orchestrators, they're on fairly time-consuming release cycles, and the underlying storage provider that we're, we're dealing with with these storage plugins kind of is on its own independent release cycle. And if you come across a scenario where you've got a security patch, a bug fix, that originates down in the provider of the underlying storage, you might have to wait to get that into the source tree of the container orchestrator, and that's a bad thing. I mean, a security patch is often critical, and you'd like to get that in as soon as possible, but if, you, if there was just a release of Apache Mesos, and the next one isn't likely to occur for another five weeks, uh, you widen this exposure gap, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, from the background of a storage provider, and I'm kind of in the shoes of one of these being an open source group affiliated with uh, Dell, uh, you're dealing with a current world, and it's not just me, but these other storage providers, Diamante, Portworks, Amazon, Azure, the public clouds like Google Cloud, we don't really want to implement these plugins four times for four different container orchestrators. It would be great for us if we could do it one time and then reuse that. It allows us to uh, more efficiently use resources, maybe have these resources left over to invest in a heavier degree of testing and validation. And, you know, uh, even if there is a scenario of a security patch, if we have to go apply that and test it across four or five different container orchestrators, it's that much longer for these things to get out. Um, so the summary is that a storage provider wants to write and maintain one plugin that covers everything. From the, the state of the world today, just to show you how bad this is out there in the world, uh, I went out there and did some research using Google to find out how many storage plugins exist just for Amazon EBS, and I found five of them. You know, the, it's sad that in an open source world, you'd have five independent and, and have to have five imp implementations of plugins for AWS EBS. Uh, to visually summarize this, what we're trying to avoid is this. That's a picture of worldwide electric st outlet standards. I came here from Los Angeles, and that means when I bring my laptop, I've got to get some adapter. And this scenario is what that storage interface is with container orchestrators today. Uh, and the downside of this is users have difficulty using devices portably. If you're an appliance maker, the, you know, the, the, the analogy to a storage provider, you have reduced economies of scale. You've got to do your engineering in multiple passes, and often there's certification involved, and it incurs testing delays. Um, vendors who sell these or bring them to market or distribute them have to in inventory larger inventories of different versions, and that might result in you foregoing entry into some markets. I mean, maybe someday there'll be a sixth container orchestrator, and I as a storage provider would just say, no, I'm not, it's too much work, I'm not going to do that. But if we get a standard in place, it, it, it opens it up for, you know, evolution and uh, uh, creativity from different people. At this point, uh, it's a multi-presenter uh, multi presentation today, and I'm going to turn this over to James. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about CSI a little bit. 
Uh, the primary goal of CSI is to present a neutral standard protocol for container orchestrators uh, and their interaction with proprietary storage systems. Uh, CSI presents a consistent set of behaviors and expectations for both container orchestrators and vendor implementations of CSI. Uh, for vendors, like Steve was saying, uh, there's less work involved to support you know, X number of COs, uh, which allows vendors to enable more COs uh, more quickly. Uh, for container orchestrators, it uh, gives access to a broader storage ecosystem. Um, orchestrators can leverage open APIs, and they have looser coupling uh, with backend storage systems. Uh, some other goals uh, of CSI, uh, especially with respect to this version that we're iterating on, uh, we're trying to keep the set of APIs relatively small, uh, but still enable many use cases, kind of aiming for a lowest common denominator uh, API. Uh, and what this will do is lower the barrier of entry for the initial round of CSI plugin writers. Great, so from a high level, uh, CSI presents a control plane interface that is largely focused on volume lifecycle. It is a service-oriented interface uh, as opposed to a command line interface. Uh, this allows plugins to easily co-locate with other long-running processes. Uh, think about Fuse Daemon or GlusterFS services or NFS services. Those are all long-running services that, that co-locate well with, with plugins. Uh, services are exposed via gRPC. Uh, some advantages to this, uh, there's well-understood mechanisms for proxying and load balancing uh, gRPC calls. Uh, gRPC supports streaming responses, which, although we're not taking advantage of those uh, in the first version of CSI, uh, the door is open for later versions. Uh, gRPC also scales well. It's an open specification, and there's great community support. With respect to configuration and operation, uh, CSI allows plug-in supervisors, which means a container orchestrator or something else, uh, that's, that's supervising the lifecycle of the plugin uh, to decide how to deploy uh, and or isolate plugins. CSI does not specify security protocols. An operator would protect a CSI Unix socket just like they would protect other file system objects. Uh, CSI, with respect to packaging, there's no mandated container image format. Uh, the spec suggests that uh, providers try to use something that's cross CO compatible. Again, there's minimal expectations with respect to uh, supervision. Uh, generally speaking, plugins should terminate upon request, uh, for example, like a SIG term. Isolation is not guaranteed, uh, but it is very likely. So for example, uh, I'm pretty sure Kubernetes is planning isolation. We're planning isolation with Mesos, uh, but it's not guaranteed. Other uh, COs may not isolate. And even across COs, that isolation may not be the same. So CSI consists of three gRPC services. Uh, these services may be composed in different ways depending on the deployment requirements. Uh, that's determined by the uh, plugin vendor. Uh, for example, uh, a headless deployment would bundle all three of these services together. Uh, to further illustrate this idea is this slide. So uh, on the left, um, it's more of a centralized model where you've got a controller service uh, running on a master node, and then you've got all the CSI node services running on the agent nodes. So the controller centralized, the node services are distributed. Uh, in the diagram on the right is uh, what I called headless before, where you've got all three services. Well, in this case, I've only shown the controller and the node, uh, but identity is in there too. So you've got all the plugin services uh, running on all the agents in the cluster, uh, and there's nothing specifically running uh, in the center or on the master nodes. Whoops, there are a couple more points here. Uh, how do I go back? Ah, uh, yeah, the last point I wanted to make is that uh, it's up to an operator to configure a container orchestrator uh, with, respect to, with respect to deployment, um, and it's up to a plugin vendor to provide the documentation regarding deployment. Uh, none of that's um, specified in CSI itself. Great. So the lifetime of a volume uh, from creation to deletion is illustrated on the right. Uh, there's different volume states uh, that, that volumes go through as CSI RPCs are invoked. 
And what's important to understand here is that it's the CO that's really driving the provisioning process. Uh, so a CO is going to invoke the controller publish volume, uh, which might mean uh, attach some volume or some device to a node. Uh, the CO will then invoke uh, a node publish volume, which probably means, hey, go mount this volume in some container. Uh, plugins advertise support for lifecycle operations via capability RPCs. Uh, an example of some of these uh, up on the slide there, create and delete is a capability, and the controller publish and unpublish are capabilities. Next couple of slides, I'm just going to briefly walk through the API. Uh, this API is intended for consumption by container orchestrators. It's not something that Mesos end users will see. Uh, that said, it's still useful to understand what's happening under the hood. And it's also useful for you if you want to take a stab at writing a CSI plugin. So first up is the identity service. Uh, this is important for version negotiation. It allows a container orchestrator to select a supported version of uh, the API for use with future RPC invocations. All CSI endpoints must support this service. It is not optional. Uh, the controller service. This uh, maybe runs in a central location, or else it could run on the nodes themselves uh, across the cluster. Uh, the RPCs here are kind of split up. The, the top two RPCs are the required RPCs. The bottom four RPCs are optional. And the optional ones are selected through the capabilities API, um, which is the first call. So the get capabilities uh, RPC just reports which controller RPCs are implemented by the plugin. So that's discoverable by the orchestrator. Uh, validate volume capabilities allows an orchestrator to ask, does volume X support some Y set of capabilities? Um, and that's important because uh, a plugin may not provide the create and delete calls. Uh, volumes may be pre-created. Uh, maybe a CEO gets a list of volumes from a plugin, uh, and it needs to validate that, hey, does this volume actually support this thing that I want to do with it? Uh, the next four RPCs, like I said, are optional. Uh, they create and delete calls. Uh, create is what you think it is. Um, allows a container orchestrator to tell the plugin, I'd like to create a volume given some name, some size, and some set of capabilities. Um, and then at some point, I want to delete that volume. Uh, there's the controller publish and the controller unpublish volume. Uh, this used to be called attach and detach. Those names really didn't fit all the workflows that we envisioned. Uh, it's really useful for centralized deployments, uh, where you have a central plugin controller that's executing these RPCs. Uh, it could also be useful for headless deployments. Uh, I think the example that came up in one of the discussions was iSCSI. Somebody wanted to implement specific iSCSI commands um, when controller publish and unpublish were invoked. Uh, the next call, list volumes. Uh, the intent here is to show pre-created volumes. Um, it doesn't require create and delete, but plugins are certainly free to implement uh, any subset of these, these calls. And uh, the get capacity call reports the available space on the back end. Uh, presumably, a CO would invoke this before calling create so that it knows how much space is there before it tries to create a volume that maybe takes up too much space. Uh, lastly is the node service. Uh, this service must run on the nodes upon which volumes are mounted. Uh, the first call, probe node, allows a CO to instruct the plugin, hey, go check your configuration, check for any required software or devices uh, that are needed on that node. Uh, if the plugin fails this call, that's a signal to the orchestrator that uh, the plugin's not ready and it should not try to do any kind of volume lifecycle management. Uh, the node publish and unpublish calls, you can think about these like mount and unmount volumes. Uh, they're invoked on a per workload basis to mount a volume or unmount a volume to or from a container. Uh, the get node ID call presents a consistent identifier for the node from the perspective of a plugin instance. And the last call, get capabilities, uh, used to just be a placeholder. Uh, there's a PR in flight right now to add a capability um, to kind of separate out some of the responsibility that right now lives within node publish and unpublish. That new capability is publish and unpublish device. Um, and I think that's it. I'd like to turn the rest of this over to G who's going to talk about uh, CSI and, and how it's going to be integrated into Mesos. G? Right, thanks, James. 
Yeah, um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, like CSI is great that we have this um, vendor neutral uh, interface that across all the container orchestration system. And then the question is how Mesos is going to leverage that interface and how Mesos is going to um, build features on top of those uh, interface. Um, so, um, so, so for Mesos, we're going to introduce a new concept called uh, resource provider. So think about right now inside Mesos, the only resource provider you have right now is the agent. So agent provide resources like CPU, memory, disk, and the master keep track of those resources and send to the framework uh, using an offer. Um, but, um, but this is not very flexible. Uh, like there's no way currently, like, I mean, well, people can use custom resources, but you, do, you cannot. Uh, right now, you don't have a way to um, customize the, the like, handling of operation on those resources. For example, uh, if you want to define a custom operation, you want to perform on that resources, trying to convert the resources, there's no way you can do that in Mesos right now. So as part of the storage work, we try to introduce this general concept called resource provider so that uh, uh, we allow developers to um, develop on their own resource provider that providing resources to Mesos, and the Mesos master will collect those resources and apply coda, reservation, all these resource uh, primitive, uh, and then uh, send those resources to the, um, the allocator, the framework. And, uh, uh, and resource provider can be either local or uh, external. So um, by local, I mean that the resource that this resource provider provides are tied to a particular agent node. Um, uh, external means like the resource you provide don't tie to a particular node, things like IP addresses, uh, EBS, volume, those are kind of external resources that don't tie to a particular node. So we're going to introduce both local resource provider and an external resource provider. Uh, and, and if you think about that, agent can be think of a, uh, a combination of task management plus local resource provider. Um, so why introduce RP? Uh, as I mentioned, like we allow customization and extension on resources, and 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 one of the biggest reason we introduced this um, concept is because we want to support external resources, aka like global resources, um, that Mesos use don't support previously. But I think we do see a lot of use cases that global resource definitely useful. So um, we definitely want to introduce that um, concept. So and uh, we introduce global resource through resource provider concept. Okay. Okay, so uh, so we're gonna introduce a first class storage resource provider, which is tied to uh, the the storage work we want to do with CSI. Uh, we're gonna introduce a, a storage sto resource provider that talks to CSI plugins, uh, and uh, um, this storage resource provider will expose disk resources um, to Mesos, and it will be responsible for handling operations, things like volume provisioning and volume mounting as well. Uh, and, and the goal we want to achieve inside Mesos is, uh, in the end, and the storage vendor just need to give that CSI plugin Docker image or a, a, a binary to Mesos, and Mesos will just take care of the rest and, uh, um, and give you resources to frameworks. So that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we don't want the user or the operator to be uh, and like. I mean, we don't want to. We definitely don't want the user to be aware of all these internal CSI stuff. Uh, to users, it's all just resources. The same resource you get right now inside your framework. Um, uh, so this is kind of the high-level architecture of uh, how this is going to work. So uh, as I mentioned, we have. Uh, you, you can see here, so you have a master node and an agent node. So uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're going to introduce an uh, external resource provider. So for storage, we're going to introduce a first class uh, storage external resource provider that talks to the Mesos master directly because the resource it provides does not tie to any particular agent. It does not make sense um, to run that on a particular agent. But essentially, you can run this provider on any agent. Uh, and then, uh, for example, schedule by marathon to run that plugin uh, on any agent, and that will talk to Mesos master through uh, HTTP API to provide those resources to master. And that storage external resource provider will, uh, in the end, uh, talk to a EBS, for example, like uh, talk to a storage vendor's controller plugin. As James mentioned, uh, in CSI, we have this controller service and no service. Controller service can be run anywhere, so uh, the, the external resource provider will talk to controller service to uh, do things like provisioning and deprovisioning uh, a given volume. 
And then on the agent side, as you can see here, uh, we have a we, we introduce a storage local resource provider for our um, local disk resources. And it's, it talks to a CSI plugin as well. In this case, I use an LVM as an example. Like say you have a bunch of disk, you want to treat that as a single pool and uh, uh, send resources to Mesos Master. So uh, and, and and we can build an LVM plugin for that. And LVM is responsible for ha handling all these provisioning and deprovisioning volume requests. Um, uh, coming from the CSI interface. Um, and also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as, I, uh, as James mentioned earlier, that you have to run some node plugin on the node that you want to use the volume. Just think about the EBS case. Once you provision the EBS volume, uh, eventually you want, to e you want to attach the EBS volume to your given node and actually mount the volume. And that operation can only happen on the node you want to use the volume. So we need to deploy an EBS node plugin on the node as well. Uh, and that will be handled um, by the agent itself to, to launch that node plugin container. And the agent will talk to that um, node plugin container using CSI protocol as well. Uh, so that it can actually like, make sure that volume actually show up and mount it on a given location so that the container can use those um, volumes. So we're going to support both local and external storage providers and support all the CSI plugins. Um, so this is kind of a roadmap uh, in Mesos for uh, storage support. So we're going to support local resource provider first because it's more tied to the current model. And, and, and then we're going to build a local uh, storage resource provider with CSI. Um, and then we're going to move to external resource provider integration and then um, build a CSI integration there. So there's an app you can track the progress there. So LRP is a local resource provider for storage. It's in target for next release, which is 1.5. And the external, storage res external resource provider uh, support is target for 1.6, the, the, the next release after 1.5. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to um, Steve. Thanks. So um, I'm here representing a, uh, a storage provider. And uh, the storage provider that uh, my team works on, the code team, is something called Rexray that has been around for a while already in the Mesos environment, but it, it was implementing the Mesos proprietary storage interface. But we've spent the, a good portion of this year enhancing this to drive Rexray to become a CSI compatible storage plugin. Uh, and the benefit, of course, here is that we'll be able to use the same code to interoperate across multiple container orchestrators, uh, like Mesos, but others as well. Uh, now, the, the key point I want to make today that is that Rexray uh, is a CSI uh, compatible provider uh, at MesosCon North America on the Sunday before it started. We announced implementation in Rexray version uh, 0.10 uh, for CSI support. Uh, the the overview you can see here. Uh, we've been delivering support for persistent volumes for Mesos for around two years now. So this is nothing new in the Mesos environment. Uh, but our 0 0.10 released on September 12th brought an implementation of the CSI proposed specification. The orchestrator vendors behind this are still declaring this CSI spec to be a pre-release at this point. But I think uh, as soon as the first two build, them in, build implementations, this will be declared a release. They just wanted to retain the option to potentially change something should somebody spot a mistake. I mean, it, you can't prove that it's interoperable until at least two instances have managed to pull it off. Um, but somebody had to go first. And rather than wait for the orchestrators to do their end and have nothing to attach to and nothing to test with, uh, the code team uh, decided that we wanted to get out there and do that groundwork to provide the ability to uh, hook up with something if you're a container orchestrator and actually do your development and testing. So this should be compatible with Mesos, Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm. On the roadmap, we're planning uh, the 0 0.11 release October 16. I don't know if uh, we're already past that. Uh, I believe that happened, right, Clint? Okay. 
So that got out there too. The, the late ad there was, this deck dates back to, to BezosCon uh, North America, so I didn't update the deck, but it is out there. The feature added in the 11 release was support for Azure unmanaged disks. Uh, this is an architectural overview of what Rexray looks like as a CSI storage provider. As mentioned before by James, the primary interface to the container orchestrator is a gRPC uh, interface, so the uh, Rexray plugin implements that. It's written in the Go language. Uh, we have implementations for a number of different flavors of storage. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there are components involved here that operate uh, at both a client and server level, and we are working on conformance, uh, conformance libraries so that we have a test suite that we can use to validate that these things uh, are compliant with the specification. Uh, what we've got today, this is a quick wrap-up. Uh, on the right side, you can see the support for public cloud forms of storage. So we've got all the popular forms of storage on Amazon. We've got persistent disks in the Google Cloud, uh, block storage in DigitalOcean, and the latest uh, ad was the support for the Microsoft Azure Unmanaged Disk. Over on the on-prem on side, we've got support for Ceph RBD. Uh, we've got a whole class of uh, a classification of local storage uh, these would be things that would be uh, mountable on the local cluster nodes. We've got coverage for uh, block device, NFS, uh, VFS. Uh, for uh, hardware or software-based storage uh, in the Dell family, we've got support for Scale.io and Isilon. And on OpenStack, we've got a, a Cinder interface supported. Uh, at this point, even though I'm going to keep talking in the original presentation, the second storage vendor, Diamante, was supposed to come on stage. Uh, so pretend I'm Chakri now. Uh, so from the perspective of Chakri as a uh, Diamante storage provider, they already dealt with support for multiple container orchestrators, and they were actually one of the pioneers over on the Kubernetes side of this thing called a flex volume interface that was a generic stor storage interface that called out to a command line uh, or an exec form of mount on mount for volumes. And it got a fair amount of traction over on Kubernetes. I don't, Flex really didn't have that much of an equivalent over on the Meso side at any time, but it was an example of a storage provider maybe treading a little water harder than they should have to in that they're you know, doing work on multiple platforms that uh, we're hoping will go away. Uh, uh, from the perspective of Diamante, they're now happy to be working with the CSI community to bring these uh, container orchestrator platforms together. Uh, so finally, Diamante liked the fact that CSI means that there's one storage plugin interface that delivers it to multiple platforms, give, brings the benefit of reducing development time and increasing the time left over to do testing. So uh, if you're blowing less resource on duplicated effort, you can, you can reallocate that to doing innovation and work on collaboration. So uh, Diamante is a backer of this as well. Uh, there are others. Uh, these are uh, people who've announced that they're participating in the CSI project. There's logos there for both storage providers and orchestrators. Um, so the roadmap, right now we've got a, a pre-release spec, and the orchestrators are planning to support this. Uh, I can't really speak on their behalf, but I believe it's fair to say that they anticipate this being by end of year for the Kubernetes and Mesos platforms. Uh, if they might miss that, they probably shouldn't miss it by much. There are some things that didn't get in that first cut of the spec, but these things are on the roadmap. 
So, you know, there's always that trade-off of put everything but the kitchen sink and release one and then it's going to take longer. And these roadmap items that we'll get in to release n, you know, one plus n are support for snapshot, volume resizing, uh, quotas, windows, the win container support for the Windows OS, and user ID and credential pass through to the storage provider. Um, there's one, ish, one thing that's deemed out of source simply because the different container orchestrator uh, providers, Mesos, Kubernetes, really had different architectural ideas or wanted, wanted to use this as distinguishing features and that was storage class, something that's often referred to as profiles in the virtualization world. And those, those are not destined to become standardized through the container storage interface. It's kind of a higher level of managing and mapping classes of storage to containers that are uh, controlled by a scheduler. Uh, I'm going to close here with uh, a, a uh, call to action to the community for people to get involved. Right now, a number of orchestrator uh, developers are heavily involved with this project as well as a number of storage providers. But we could use some more increased involvement by the user community. How would you get involved? Well, we have a GitHub repository that retains the CSI specification. And you can go look at it and you could create issues against that specification. Um, if you want to get a background, we have recurring meetings that are done under Zoom. They're, the link here, the link is there, and this deck has been uploaded to the Linux Foundation, so I believe you can already download this deck. Um, if it didn't get there yet, this deck is largely unchanged since the original presentation in MesosCon North America, so I know for a fact it's there already. Um, anyway, you can go to that Zoom link get the schedule from, uh, from the links here and just join that call. Uh, you've missed some of the calls, but the, a running log of the notes from those calls is kept at the, the link you see there. And uh, these Zoom meetings are recorded, so you, if you'd prefer to digest that in the actual audio rather than reading the notes, that's available as well. There's a Google mailing list that uh, is actually quite active in this community from both the perspective of orchestrators and storage providers. Um, like I say, I'd like you to get on board because this is one of the real benefits of open source as opposed to closed source commercial products where you get that step where you as a customer would go through a process of going to a vendor, maybe getting their product manager to put your request on the feature list here, you can get right up in front of the developers' faces, and there's a unique opportunity now because we're still building this for the first time that it's perhaps easy, if, if you spot an omission or you have a, a real need for a unique request that maybe we haven't thought of, now's the time to get in there. The other reason for getting in there now is if you're a large organization that maybe anticipates pushing the envelope for performance or scale on this, by getting involved now where we're having active discussions on the design, you'll inherently get that deep dive view so you have a real understanding of the fundamentals of why things were built the way they were, how things are glued together, where things live. And sometimes after a project is a couple years old, it isn't all that easy to pick up on those kinds of things. So even if you want to get involved with this community as a lurker, just to listen listen in on what's going on in these design decisions, in my mind, that's a great opportunity that you don't always get. So I really encourage you to get involved here. Um, so at that point, that's the wrap-up for the presentation. I think we've got uh, a few minutes left to handle questions, if anybody's got any. Yeah, we have 15 minutes for questions. Any questions? Well, people are thinking about questions. Okay. Could you please tell me the story of your logo? Who designed it? Where does it come from? 
Uh, oh, the CSI logo. The it, CSI logo. We actually uh, commissioned a number of implementations uh, of a logo and put it out for a vote. And uh, it was, hand the microphone over to Clint there in the first row because he's the one who organized that effort. Uh, so the, the logo's background is that we um, opened it up to the CSI community to participate and to vote on the different logos. Uh, so Saad and all the CEOs and you know, the team up here on the stage were able to participate and vote on what they liked. Uh, so there were about 80 different logos. Uh, so I don't know if there's a specific story to tell other than everybody liked this one and this was the most popular logo. <laughs> yeah, so there it is. Oops. It, it's the... Oh. I went back too far. I want to bring it up so we know what we're talking about here. I mean, it, it's the orange. Oh, one more. So it's the orange thing. Yeah. So the um, the description that we asked for from the artists was to present something that was connecting two things together. Uh, so hence you have the dot in the middle, which represents the interface, and then you've got on the top maybe the CO, and on the bottom a storage platform. So I didn't vote for this. I actually called called this, I kind of dissed it, calling it, you know, CSI really only works at the control plane of storage. So it does the mount, unmount, the attach of devices to nodes. So it's a control plane. It isn't involved in the data plane, so there's no latency added by using this. And I called this logo snakes on a con control plane. Um, or better, the snake, to me, it looks like the snake that ate all your data. And if you like the logo, in the code booth, we've got some embroidered patches with it, so come by the booth after this breaks up and get yourself one. We've got stickers with it, too. Okay. Any real questions? <laughs> <laughs> we got one right there. I have a question to the Mesosphere guys. Uh, is there uh, thinking about how to design that storage class concept, the profile concept, where may maybe link to the quotas uh, on both capacity and IOPS, how would the implementation look like? Yeah, so uh, there's protobufs that are, have even either landed or will land uh, in Mesos uh, to support like a, a profile name that can be associated um, with a volume. Um, there's some ongoing work in DCOS to add support for, to add like an, an underlying implementation for profiles. Uh, so it, it is something we're thinking about, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what is a profile? How do you, how do you associate parameters with a profile? Things like that. So maybe I'm thinking there, there might be some new adopters of Mesos or DCOS in the audience, so it might be worthwhile to explain the value proposition of why you want to have these classes or profiles. If, I'd be happy to answer it because as a storage provider, I'm yeah. aware of it, Go but ahead, you Steve. can have it. Sure. So the, the whole idea of these classes is that you as an application writer, a dev, really don't want to link your storage needs coming out of the application to specific identities of a volume or a type of storage because that stuff changes over time and it changes as you move from an on-prem situation to a public cloud or from one public cloud to a different one. They have different types of storage there. So the last thing you want to do is say something in your app like, I want my relational database, my Postgres database to link up to an SSD provided by Scale.io because if you were to ever move that to AWS, it doesn't exist there. What you'd prefer is a scenario where you define these classes with names that are managed by an administrator. So a class might be the fast class, meaning high performance but expensive storage, and a slow class or a cheap class, which is stuff where you'd prefer to save money. And if you take the example of a relational database, they might have things like index tables that would greatly benefit from utilizing that fast class of storage, but they could have other things like log files that you'd really like to save the money because they don't really have performance demands. And if you abstract those out with these broad general descriptions of fast and, and slow or fast and cheap, those tend to be consistent across clouds. 
So if I defined a fast class in Amazon that might map to high performance storage in Amazon that costs me more and the slow to slower, and that same thing could be mapped to other categories in Google's cloud or to your on-prem storage, it also can be consistent across time. So if you put yourself in a time machine, went back five years with that relational database, fast might have been 15,000 RPM rotating drives, and slow would have been the slower drives, but it's all rotating. Today, fast would clearly be SSDs, and then slow might be still rotating, but those fast and slow labels would still apply. You, don't, you could change in one place for your whole data center the mapping of fast to some class and slow to a different one, and at the app level, no, you don't have to touch anything. So it saves you operational expense. You, the goal here is that your app definition and configuration lives for a long time without administrative in intervention. And that storage class thing is a great feature to have because it can lower your operational cost. Yeah, so, so to translate to Mesos API, we can add an interaction in the resource object called profile name, and that will be exposed to the framework. So frame do scheduling decisions based on the name of the profile rather than like a raw parameters of a disk like SSD or Spindle disk or like IOPS. So they, base, they do the decision to pattern matching on those profile names. So it's kind of a level of interaction. So that name can be mapped to different things to, on diff, in different times. But I mean, operator will be responsible for config those mappings. But framework make decision both based on those profile name, user make their selection. Like say, I want to use a profile blue or profile fast disk. Uh, user make those decisions based on those names. It's just like a level of interaction. I okay, think I think we, we killed we his call question. Call, yeah, <laughs> call it an extensive There's another one up there the in the middle, I think. There's another one. More questions? Here is a hand. How does uh, open SDS uh, relate to CSI? Uh, sorry, what's the question? I think How it was open, open SDS. SDS. Open uh, software defined stor uh, storage. Uh -huh. There was uh, yesterday a lot of uh, noise about it, so. And how does it relate to CSI? How does that relate to S CSI, Open SDS? OK, so um, the question is, like, how does Open SDS? There's, uh, I'm not sure everyone uh, knows about Open SDS. There's a, a, a kind of a platform from Huawei right, that uh, wants to, um, to um, do the pretty similar things, trying to um, um, provide a platform, allow different vendors to um, plug it into that platform, and the OpenSD has also has this northbound API to talk to the container orchestrators. And the question is, what's the relationship between CSI and the OpenSDS? Um, so we start the, the CS, CSI project around the same time as OpenSDS. If I remember correctly, that was last November or last December. Uh, at that time, um, I think we just I think we pretty much started the project simultaneously. I think one of the things that we want to achieve in CSI particularly is trying to be storage vendor neutral so that we all the container orchestration system get together and trying to define a standard and that we don't want to actually if you see the doc right now, there's a community doc which we explicitly say that we want the maintainers to be uh, from all container orchestration systems so that we can ensure the standard is storage vendor neutral. Uh, I think that's a key thing to um, drive the standard to be successful. Um, and I think um, OpenSDS is from Huawei, who is a storage vendor itself. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, one thing that I see might be problematic for a standard. But I think I don't see really a, a huge difference, just like two APIs. And uh, um, CSI, just the one that we agree on among all these container orchestration systems. And then we start about the same time. We're not aware of OpenSDS at the time when we start the project. Yes, we do have some chat with um, OpenSDS people. Um, actually, um, I think OpenSDS is more similar to live storage. Yeah, or perhaps Rexray. I'm not yeah. a spokesman for what their roadmap is. Um, perhaps they intend to implement a CSI interface yeah, on they top have, of OpenSDS, I but I can't speak for that. Yeah, I think I chat with OpenSDS folks uh, a few times. I think there are, like two, there are different ways they, they can integrate with CSI. One way is you can build a um, CSI plugin in their northbound API. 
Um, so that's one way. So, so basically, I treat, treat OpenSDS as a meta CSI plugin that um, they have their own interface that other storage vendor plugging into their interface. And uh, when container orchestration system wants to talk to OpenSDS, it's through the CSI interface. So that's one way. The other way is I think I talked to OpenSDS guys is because they also want to uh, handle the provisioning, like, like sending resources to Mesos um, to uh, like kind of Run the storage itself onto Mesos, uh, on the container orchestration system. So another way to do that is they build a Mesos framework that providing resource, like the resource provider API that I mentioned earlier, that they build a, a resource provider um, that talk to Mesos to provide resources to Mesos and they handle all these volume provisioning uh, requests and then send those requests to the corresponding backend drivers in OpenSDS. So that's one way. So we, we chat about these two possible ways. More questions? Uh, we've got one right here. OK. Mm. Two questions. The first one is, is CSI related to, to, to replace persistent volumes in Mesos? Uh, is intended to, mm, mm. to replace them? OK, so the question is, will CSI replace persistent volume inside Mesos? The answer is no. They're going to be coexist. These are two orthogonal concepts. Just think about persistent volume is just another layer because not all the volumes are persistent. Some volume can be ephemeral. Well, but what I mean by ephemeral here is like the life cycle of the volume does not have to be persistent. When container terminates, that volume get gc right away. The reason for that, for example, I just want an SSD disk for a scratch space. I don't care the persistence. I just want the speed, things like this. So these two concepts are not, not exactly the same. They're orthogonal. So you can have a persistent volume on a CSI, CSI disk, or you can have a persistent volume on the traditional local disk because we need to be backwards compatible. But eventually, like everyone should move to CSI, so it's backed by a CSI plugin. That CSI plugin can be a dumb CSI plugin, just like having directory under having subdirectories under directory to pretend to be a volume, things like this. So that would be exact the same behavior as it is right now for the local persistent volume that we have right now. So I think it's fair to say what you just said is for a while they'll both be available in parallel. Yeah, I mean and these are first of all yeah. these are two orthogonal concepts because CSI volume is just really the volume and you can be persistent volume and there can be ephemeral volume which is on top of those primitives. These are uh, like orthogonal concept. And then I'll say if you're using the existing persistent volume support in Mesos with Rexray, I can tell you that those volumes will be portable. In other words, if you commission a Postgres server right now today in the current release and go through Rexray to get to it, you won't have to blow that away or back it up and restore it. You will be able to simply remount that volume using the Rexray CSI plugin. So uh, there's, there's not an issue of rip and replace. Uh, it's simply going to be unmount and remount. It should take seconds yeah. really to flip over. If you are a framework writer, then then the API you're going to create persistent volume will be exactly the same for local local one, like the, the traditional like legacy volume and CSI volume. So the front framework's perspective, it will be exactly the same. The only difference is the profile that we just mentioned that uh, it provides an interaction allowing you to do make decisions based on some name that maps to a bunch of disk parameters. So that that will be the only difference. There should be no difference from framework's perspective. All right. So the the second question is related to the to the to the frameworks. So, is um, how is the future of DCOS commons relate to CSI standard? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? The future of DCOS commons relate to the CSI standard. It should be. It, it will include uh, additional features to support. Oh yeah, so, so the question is whether DCOS Common is going to support CSI. The answer is yes, it's on the roadmap. It's definitely going to be happening uh, after DCOS 1.11. It's on the roadmap. OK, we have two more minutes. We can get more questions. Uh, OK, so you mentioned um, LVM as a, an implementation for uh, local volumes. Uh, can you? Tell us a bit about that. Is there any plans to do something in Mesos around that or, or not? Uh, L L LVM? Yeah. OK. So the question is, do you want to take that question, or do you want me to? Yeah. So it's, it's LVM, LVM and yeah. what the support plans are? Is, that is there any plan to um, 
Yeah, it's ah. a concrete implementation uh, around LVM. So as an implementation of CSI. Because you mentioned that in the, in the talk, so. Yeah, so we, we are building uh, an implementation internally at Mesosphere um, to use LVM. Uh, there are plans to build a reference implementation that will be open source. Uh, it is on the roadmap. I cannot promise a delivery date, but it is something that we do want to open source. Yeah, I mean, building an LVM plugin should be pretty straightforward. I, I don't think it's too complicated. It's just like you have a bunch of volume, like physical volume, and group into a volume group. And then whenever you receive a request to provision a volume, just create a volume group using LVM command or like any library, like libLVM. It should be pretty straightforward. I don't think any, there's any secret source there. Um, but uh, I mean, in your, uh, your feeling is that the user will have to prepare this volume, or the implementation is supposed to take care about everything? Like the, the yeah, so user, I mean, if, if, you, you're, if you're talking about user, like marathon user, they should not be aware of whether it's from LVM or not. They no, probably I mean, just I pick the volume from profile. Well, I mean, in that case, I'm, uh, user uh, means operator. Oh, operator, do they need to be aware of LVM or not? Is that the question? Yeah, uh, uh, at which point the, the, um, the implementation is supposed to prepare the LVM config. Uh, that was my, my point. Oh, OK. Yeah, this so. May be, this may be not defined, so sorry about that. But, uh, OK, yeah. so, so I, th I think if I interpret your question correctly, are you saying that the LVM implementation should be open source and should be contribute back to the, the so, so everyone can use that? Is that the intention of the question? Uh, not that much. It was uh, your uh, having your your uh, your feeling about what would be the current implementation in LVM. It's maybe not defined, so I would be okay with this answer. Uh, but is is it defined or not? Like, do you have any plan, concrete plan for that, or, or not, or the LVM implementation? So maybe I can help here. So maybe the question is, to what extent operators should be involved? to take your implementation, the LVM implementation, and deploy it in the cluster? Is it the question? So what work, what expertise is expected from the operator? Oh, okay, yeah, that's so the question. Uh, I think as I mentioned, oh, okay, sorry, I misinterpreted your question. So I think our goal, as I mentioned in one of the slides, the goal is the, the, the operator just need to hand over to Mesos a single container image name or a single binary for the CSI plugin, which is the LVM plugin. And Mesos will just take care of the rest to deploy those plugins if it's not launched yet and talk to those plugins to, to communicate through CSI interface to provision volume. So the only thing the operator needs to do is provide that container image name and most likely it's version. You can also upgrade the version if you want to redeploy that plugin using a new version. So that's the only thing that the operator needs to do. Our whole goal is trying to simplify the operator as well to not to worry about internal details. Just the container will be running on the Mesos agent for those CSI plugins. The Mesos agent will talk to those CSI plugins um, uh, for LVM, at least for the LVM case. For external case, it's a little tricky because you have to run the controller plugin somewhere and you probably need to involve something like Marathon or Aurora to schedule those containers somewhere. But at the very least, you don't need to worry about building, I mean, like, you don't need to worry about the implementation detail of the LVM plugin. You just need to specify some container image name in some app config. That's it. I think it's also interesting to mention from a framework perspective, there's some new uh, resource offer operations uh, that are going to be available within Mesos. And those resource offer operations will map you know, s directly, semi-indirectly to CSI uh, plugin operations. So that a fr it's actually possible to write a framework uh, that can interact with plugins kind of through Mesos and the offer operation API. Yeah, so I think, yeah, that's a good point. So one thing you can do with LVM, I, and like, which we cannot do before, is you, you can just model a giant a volume group as a giant pool of disk space. And then the framework can make a decision to carve a volume from that volume group. So may maybe some framework say, hey, I'm opening it. I want to control the size of each volume. I don't want the operator to pre-pick a size for each volume. So right with the CSI work, you can do that. Basically, you can say, hey, these are the storage space. It's like a 1,000 gig, like a terabyte. And I, want, I only want a 10 gig volume. Just create that 10 gig volume for me. and then. Once you issue that operation to Mesos, you will receive a feedback later saying, hey, you see an offer later with a 10 gig disk in your offer stream. Then you can start to use this volume. So that will be uh, also possible with the CSI work, the storage work. 
Yeah, so it looks like for Operate is very easy. You take the binary, put into your cluster, and wait for a page in the middle of the night when the snake eats all your data. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? There is one more. We can probably take the last one. Yeah, I mean, if you have more questions, I'm, I'm here, uh, and these guys are here too, so we can talk Yeah, we're at the code booth just across the hall from the door here. I think the, there's a town hall tonight addressing storage. Oh, yeah, so there's, so. A, there's a town hall tonight. Uh, we will be there. So there are like four town hall topics, one topic is on project mesos. Um, so I'll be there. Uh, you guys are probably going to be, yeah, be there too. too. So, um, and uh, if you have more questions, you can join the town hall, and we can chat over the town hall. The whole purpose of the town hall is trying to give you guys opportunity. I mean, there are like multiple purposes. One purpose, I think, is like people get together. Like We always chat over Slack, and we don't know each other. This is a good opportunity for people to know each other in person rather than over Slack. So uh, it's a good opportunity um, if you want to join. Yeah, so can I ask last question? Yes. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, very nice initiative uh, here. And uh, on last, one of the slides, uh, it was depicted that Me Mesos agent talks uh, over HTTP and gRPC. So over HTTP through some mediator, like storage lead driver uh, to storage services, and uh, directly through gR gRPC in, a, another, uh, in another case. So the question is, what is behind this uh, architecture, and why we need HTTP when we already have gRPC at place? What? Sorry, the question is what? Uh, why uh, do, do we still need HTTP API when we already have gRPC uh, oh. uh, possibility? Yeah, available? so uh, that's a good question. So, uh, so gRPC has two sides, the client side and the server side. And I think we, all, we built the client side inside Mesos already. Um, the server side is slightly tricky because the way, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think Mesos has this goal trying to move to gRPC as a, the API. So once we get there, we just switch that. I think it's very easy to switch to gRPC once we get there. So the goal, I mean, for API, maybe not in one, V1, maybe V2 is going to be gRPC. But I cannot say that for the, the whole project. There, I think if, you, if you're interested, go to the town hall tonight. I think Mino will be there. He's the one that um, kind of maintain the API side. And we definitely have some conversation to switch to gRPC for our API. You will, it will massively simplify the client of Mesos, like the scheduler, right? You can use uh, any language that gRPC support to write a scheduler, which is a good win for us. I will vote for gRPC for all the APIs. And once we get there, it will be gRPC. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yeah. OK, thanks. Once again, we'll be in our booths and at the town hall. So if we missed your question or you wanted to keep it private, find us there. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you, guys.